Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm Ravi Kalia. I work for Ritual in Toronto. Um, we're hiring, so if you're looking for a position in Toronto, and particularly if you're interested in and have competency in causality, I'd be really keen to speak with you. Um, that's a focus for us as a firm. Cool. Um, I'm going to be talking about ML in production and particularly the sorts of problems that we face. And it's a relatively new field, so I don't have all the solutions, but there's stuff that I found through personal experience and talking to others, and I'm just sharing that. So, yay, my rise is working. Um, a lot of these ideas I'm going to articulate now have been put together probably for the first time in a paper from Google um, discussing technical debt and how it's a very high interest rate, in very high interest rate credit card. I think that's the way it's referred to in terms of building up technical debt because machine learning is fundamentally different from other types of software engineering. Uh, I recommend that paper. It's by um, D. Scully and, and authors. Um, you can find it on archive. Um, if you find anything useful, I'd be really grateful if you just sort of hit me on Twitter. So um, that would be good. Or any comments, anything sort of to improve on. Um, a quick outline. I'm just going to do a very short recap of uh, ML and this is like a very high level overview. Uh, talk about DevOps, Dev, and particularly the Ops. Um, I've got to think about graphs right now, so I'm just going to touch on graphs very briefly because um, I think that might be one way that the future evolves for machine learning. Um, then look at some of the problems in, in production and how we can advance best practice. Um, I'm not going to go through vendor solutions, so I know that a lot of the big cloud providers, they have solutions that they're putting out particularly for taking machine learning to production. I, I'm not going to do that. Um, could someone at the back just raise their hand whenever I speak too fast? I'm a Londoner and we we walk fast and we talk fast. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll try and slow things down. Right. So what do we mean by machine learning? Um, there's, a, there's, there's a popular meme of, oh, it's statistics. And if we dress it up, we get machine learning. And if we do a little more than it's AI. Um, I'd say that there's more than that going on. What we're doing is it's fundamentally a different paradigm for learning, where we induce a program from data. So whereas traditional programming, we have inputs, we specify what's needed, and then produce a program to generate the results. This is a very different thing that we're doing now, where we're putting in inputs and desired results. So the targets, if we're doing supervised learning, or something else if it's unsupervised, and then we generate a program. Either way, we're generating a sequence of ones and zeros, but I think it's fundamentally different, um, and I'll go through why that is. So I'll just go briefly, high overview of the ML recipe. Um, so we'll start off with a representation. And it will be heroic, because we'll think that, that we have an idea of how the state is being generated. And then we'll have a loss function. And we'll set it up to have some nice Euclidean properties. We'll say that Euclidean geometry can run through this. And then we'll do some cute mathematics. It'll be really nice. and. Maybe we use a first order Newtonian approximation, Newton Raphson approximation, and we say that we can solve this if we iterate enough. So, what happens at the end? After doing lots of mental gymnastics, we end up with an initial condition, usually, and a recurrence relation. And we loop through that enough to get to an ML solution to generate that program that I talked about. Um, and right now, it's awesome to try and compose it with Keras, so that's just good to go. No need for, for all this deep math there. It, it, well, we can hide it, we can put it away. Um, yeah, okay. So, if there's data parallelism, we'll throw in a GPU, because it's taking too long to run. So, if we're using deep representations, we'll have a GPU there, or TPU. And um, just because I mentioned graphs, I'm going to throw in PageRank and just quickly do a high-level overview of PageRank, just to sort of illustrate the concept. I'm assuming some people don't have that much of an ML background, so that's why I'm, I'm doing this. Won't take too long. So um, PageRank, it's what birthed a trillion-dollar company. It's just some linear algebra done to a matrix that represents graph. Um, it's not used, as, as I understand, it's not used right now in production, but it's the basis of where things started. Um, I actually went to Wikipedia and cleaned up the code. It, it, was, it wasn't as clean as it could be. Um, and I won't make you read all that, but the big picture is that we've got a data matrix that goes in, 
we have an initial condition, which in this case is random, and then we'll iterate for some number of times, and we'll do some Euclidean math in the loop, and we've got our recursive relation. Um, does someone want me to go, would you like me to go through page rank in detail? Is there a, no, okay, awesome. Uh, just, a, just a big picture overview that that's how search results used to work with links going in and out. Um, and it's sort of getting into my, my new interest right now, which is graphs, that um, there was a paper mentioning that all you need is attention. Um, there's another paper that, a, that was able to cast even page rank, CNNs, sequence models, um, most of the modern exciting algorithms that you think of, they could all be cast as graphs. So relying on Euclidean geometry on itself might not be the way to do it, but thinking about things in graphs with nodes and edges, that, that could be a way forward. Okay, so how does that help us with productionizing ML? Well, it's just like sort of a warm up. How do we productionize ML? And this is based on my experiences and people that, that I've worked with before and other teams that I've been involved with. Um, so we'll have a data scientist or a machine learning researcher. They'll work their way through Jupyter Notebook. We'll have an ML engineer who abstracts it out into clean, well done software engineering. And then we'll have an infrastructure engineer who takes it to production. But what happens by doing it this way, uh, assuming we don't have a superhero who does it all, because doing it all involves multiple layers and understanding multiple different ways of working. So if we don't do that, well, where's the testing going to be? Is it the data scientist? Is it the ML engineer? Is it on the ops side? Um, should it be all three? And when does the product get lost? Because at some point ownership moves from somebody producing a Jupyter notebook to another taking it into um, a library and then taking it to production, it's lost. Um, and I think that's something that I've personally experienced that the intention is lost from going from ideation to production. Um, just a quick note, MLOps is not AIOps. I, I had thought it was the same thing. AIOps is its own thing, which is uh, applying ML methods, so classification, regression, clustering, data reduction, to ops problems, i.e. how can we make the server, how can we notify when a server's about to go down, um, issues that are happening with, with systems in production. And the interest there is much more on causality because traditionally machine learning has been all about prediction, not knowing the cause. Effectively, we're being Bayesian and just crushing the features that aren't important when we, when we focus on the target and, the, and doing the prediction. But with causality, it's, 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 its, whole, it's an own beast. It's a beast in itself. And that's not, I don't think that's been as well articulated as it could be. And it's definitely a concern for people in AI ops. The reason being that they can manipulate the features. And in addition to that, the features are quite costly. Um, so that definitely needs work, but this talk is not about that. So we come to the mean world now. I thought this would be a way to slow me down and add some levity to, to this talk. Um, again, just to mention that prediction is not causality and correlation is definitely not causality. Um, that, as I said, probably needs more graphs, if anything. So coming to DevOps. Um, it's just to say that DevOps as a culture probably came about over the last 15 years, 10 years, as you could say it, which was the problem that was faced with producing development code on a machine and then getting that to scale onto, say, web servers or database servers and the problems that would ensue from small increments done to the development code to push that through to production. Um, the DevOps came about as not just a set of tools which were produced, but as a methodology. Uh, as a culture to merge the ideas from devs and from ops. Um, has anyone done ops, say, 15 years ago? No? Okay, so if you had, it was all based on bash scripts and the service would be left alone and the assumption would be that another um, would later on manage it down the road, there'd be maintenance and patching, etc. But this caused all kinds of problems when uh, versions were updated for devs and they weren't updated at production. Um, yeah. So, as I mentioned, it's the marriage of dev and ops, um, so that devs can deploy production code. Discipline really matters, and that's done through, um, through very short cycles of iterations of small increments, and then push, and then iterate again. And I'll just get into this. So this is the, uh, the famous TDD way of building software, 
which is before you write any code, you kind of work backwards. You have to write a test. Once you write the test, you write the minimum code to make it pass. And then for the third final piece, you do a refactor to clean up what's being produced. And then the next feature comes along and the next feature and so on. And that's, that's the way it's done. So that's the TDD part, which is integral to DevOps, um, part of the agile methodology as well. So uh, one of the keywords that I use there is um, CI and CD, continuous integration and continuous deployment. The idea there being that by using the right kind of branching strategy, we have a production branch that's always good to go, pull out into a feature, make the changes necessary, run tests, and then push back into deployment. Um, this is quite a famous uh, diagram indicating the ideas of DevOps, which is first you test, well, first you plan, then you code, then you build, you test, push it to release, deploy, operate and monitor and then come back. So that's the merging of the two cultures. Now they do have concerns, particularly for us, which is software and hardware dependencies. Although you can push things to the cloud, you'll usually find all kinds of interesting bugs turning up, um, like advisors, if anyone's been through those. Um, and, but this helps to manage scaling, performance, reliability and monitoring. So uh, how did DevOps do it? Because it's become a little bit more stable now. It, it's still changing, but the pace of innovations come down a lot. Um, well, automated unit testing, just having unit testing for everything. Um, and as I mentioned, that loop cycle, having clean loop-based uh, object functional abstractions, using Git or something like that, and having a lot of tools to enforce this discipline so you can't push to production until these tests are passed. Um, and in my experience, these patterns are just not that common to data science or machine learning. Um, and here's a bunch of tools there. Uh, probably touch base with all of them. Although there are complaints in DevOps too, which people will say DevOps is like Docker on fire because there's a lot of reliance on Docker and Kubernetes and they're their own thing. You can get lost down that rabbit hole. Sometimes it doesn't work and often people will, will revert back to using a bash script. So um, talking about practice, so the practice of ML research, what, what happens there? Well, um, there's a lot of reliance on Jupyter Notebooks. Does anybody do machine learning data science without Jupyter Notebooks? Awesome. Two, two. I think we've got two. Um, and I'm not going to hit on Jupyter Notebooks and say how horrid they are, um, but there are some anti-patterns implied in using a Jupyter Notebook. Um, and one thing particular to machine learning research is that there's this chase principle, case principle, I guess, um, which is change anything, change everything. So if you change one of your features, change one small part of the loss function, then the whole program that's output is changed. There's not an orth orthogonality that's implied in other systems development that we can make small changes to certain pieces. That just doesn't hold. Um, another experience that I've had is when I'm dealing with project, product managers, they, they can't articulate what's needed in terms of the machine learning product. So um, it's quite easy if you're building a UI or, or a web app to, to say what's needed from a product manager, they can articulate that. But when it comes to machine learning systems, um, I feel that what's needed is metrics. So if the product manager can understand uh, what F1 is, what recall is, what precision is, say, for classification, then that really helps with taking it to production and having these metrics. Also, time being a parameter. It's no good having the, the best classification system ever if it takes too long to run. Um, here's a quote that uh, Joel Bruce put out, and he's, his talk is awesome. You should look at it on YouTube. Um, it was reference to Jeremy Howard, which, which is to say that some people will say, well, you know, data science, machine learning, um, we don't need to do good software engineering um, because it's kind of like one, one off code, write once, throw away. Um, some people used to say that about Java. Okay, no, no Java dev say. <laughs> um, but I think that's an anti-pattern. If your financial well-being depends on a company and that company's making decisions based on right once code, that's, that's a problem for the company and for you. So my suggestion would be that we need to, even at the level of what one would call light data science, have a good software development process there. So, issues with the uh, deployment of ML systems. 
Um, on the data side, there's, there's a number of issues that can occur with the data coming in, changing, it's not reliable, things crash, uh, fall apart, the costs can go beyond budget. But at the end of the day, these data errors need to be treated just as well, just as thoroughly as code errors. If it's not acceptable to have bugs in code, it's not acceptable to have bugs in data. And we need tools to manage that. So if we do push the deployment, what, what tends to happen? Um, I'm going to talk about an example. It's kind of, uh, it, it's known, it's a well-known example now. Um, I'm not quite sure where this company is based. It's an investment firm called Knight Capital. And they had pieces of dead code. Um, dead code being put an if statement and put a zero inside around something that we don't think we're going to ever need anymore, but we'll just leave it there just in case. And somebody doing that, working and pushing to production, changed the zero to a one. Um, this company lost enough to reduce its stock price by uh, 70%. So changing a zero to a one and leaving that in there, for me, that's just bad code smell now, you know, knowing that some kind of version control should be used there. Um, the other the other one that I tend to see is glue code, which is relying on lots of different services and all being glued together. Uh, often, there's not a need for the whole library to be brought through. So should it be the case, for example, I'm just going to loop back to the page rank. Um, so this is about 10 lines of code. Is it right to call a library to run this algorithm or would it, wouldn't it just be better just to write it again and to have that documented there? Sorry, let's just come back. Um, yeah, so that, that was my mention of glue code. So gluing lots of different libraries together and when they're not all needed, that probably is an answer pattern too. Outputs can become dependencies, especially if you're logging what's being generated by the ML system. So let's say it's an intrusion detection system or it's a recommendation engine. If it's being logged, then who's using that? And by logging it, there's, not, there's no record being kept of where the dependencies are being built out further down the road. I also think of time as a confounder. There's different ways to think about it. My background is in statistics. So, um, People talk about performance degradation. Oh, over time, the system will, will go down. Well, why is that? It's because of time. Time is affecting, as time goes on, both the features are changing and the relationship to a target or an unsupervised algorithm is changing. And we need to be aware of that and build safeguards, safeguards around that. The, the other thought is um, feedback loops can be a real problem. The, the last project that I worked on with machine learning I was building an intrusion detection system. So the idea there being that we have an idea of normalcy and we have a few examples of what's odd. Th these were people who do promotion abuse. So you can write an algorithm, you can identify what's been the past promotion abuse, but they're pretty smart. They will just change their pattern of attack and the features that come through so it looks normal again. Um, so being aware of feedback loops in the, in the system and knowing what's going on there, I think that, that's quite important. At least to think it through. I don't know if there's an automated solution to that. Maybe something called one-class modeling. So um, coming back to, to, to an idea of, well, we have ML, an ML system. Is it just the results and data, and then we produce the model? It's not, it's not, is it? Because that's done usually in a dry environment without live operations going on. And then when you go live, you've got new data coming through. So that in itself is another area where things could break, things change, There's, there can be a delta there. And then the predictions coming out themselves and the monitoring around that, I think that also needs to be managed. So this is where the testing needs to come in across the board. So some solutions. Um, I think abstraction is really important. And so just developing through a Jupyter notebook, that might not be enough. Um, I know there's an ecosystem building out on how to take Jupyter Notebooks into production, but I feel that you have to abstract out whether you're doing it functionally or through an OOP process. Um, I feel that, that that's quite important. We've got to use Git properly. I think as a community, being like completely on top of Git and not just doing a force to get something through, or I know the few basic commands, I suspect that's not going to be good enough going forward. I'm kind of suggesting we all become devs. <laughs> Um, and in terms of the, uh, the dependencies building out on outputs, 
my suggestion would be to have a client server model because that's automatically logging the users coming in. So it could be a request response model um, or something else, but the reliance being that as soon as others are consuming the output, we're being notified of that. So we know as we make changes, who's going to be impacted. A, they can be notified, and B, we can think about what the consequences of, of dropping some features might be, of changing the algorithm might be. Um, from my experience, the client server model is the best. I've tried pub sub, but then you're not recording who's, who's making the uses. Well, that's quite scalable. Um, we should stop blue code. Uh, obviously, there's, there's got to be a fine balance there, but I do believe that having blue code and then building lots of brittle code around that, that's an anti-pattern as well. Dead features. So um, I'm not sure how many of you have had this occurrence that you've got a set of features and then another feature comes in, but it's just slightly moved. It's slightly off by a little. And then we keep the original features, but we have a copy of them effectively added on. And then at some point down the road, somebody will just pull that out and it causes problems. So I think there needs to be good pruning and taking away features that are no longer used. So some other ideas, uh, a monitoring service, um, making some plans for feedback loops as and when they occur. Maybe having an alert system to say um, that something's going wrong. It's something like an intruder detection system to say, this is not normal features coming through. This is not normal responses coming through. But we need to do something. So, um, I quote some Shakespeare there, which is to say as a community, we probably need to build around these tools and, and push them through. Um, I know there's a lot of active work taking place now, but maybe it needs to be shared more widely. Um, some trends that I've noticed personally is that the, the major providers, as I said, that they are putting out solutions if anyone's used SageMaker. Yeah, so th that's one way of doing versioning, um, but it does rely on having the model, the code, and the data all being versioned. Um, and we should have tools that make MLOps just really cheap and easy to use, cheap to me being free. Um, and then people who write the algorithms, they should probably be the ones to implement them. Maybe not taking it all the way to production, but in an ideal world, something there. Um, there's another quote, which is just that the, the force of weight of JS developers just keeps building. And I feel that as a community, we're going to have to deal with the movement towards JavaScript for, for many kinds of development. I'm saying that at a Pi Data talk. I, I do realize that. Um, some acknowledgements, these are some people that I've interacted with and built some research and collaborations with. So, um, just to acknowledge their contributions there. 